Hi, it's Katrina. Discoveries in Nazareth. A new archaeological discovery in Nazareth has revealed some interesting secrets about the past. You may remember Nazareth as the place where Jesus grew up. New research has shown that Nazareth was substantially bigger than what historians believed. It was generally thought that Nazareth was just a small village, but it was likely a huge town sprawled out in the middle of the desert. And because it was so big, the citizens of Nazareth would have been a lot more involved in the politics of the day. Researchers say the people here were probably extremely conservative and very much anti-Roman. You might be wondering how any of this is interesting. Well, it all pertains to Jesus and his rise as the Son of God. British archaeologist Ken Dark says the Jewish people living in Nazareth abided by the rules of their religion much more strictly than the surrounding cities. For example, excavation in ancient agricultural land has shown that the inhabitants of Nazareth never used human excrement to fertilize their fields, even though their neighbors in the town of Sepphoris, just four miles away, did. That's because it was considered forbidden in the Jewish religion. There is also proof of certain ceramics and objects that were religiously pure, unlike the neighboring town from the same time period. Sepphoris was heavily influenced by Greek and Roman culture, but not Nazareth. All the evidence points to the city of Nazareth being wildly conservative and the home of several revolts against the Romans. Anti-Roman rebels created a sizable network of underground hiding places and tunnels underneath the town. As researcher David Keyes says, religious Jews saw Roman and Greek influence as a serious and direct threat to their faith. This environment and political climate clearly would have shaped Jesus' views of the world. Stone Altar In the desert city of Ataroth, located in Jordan, an ancient stone altar has been discovered. The altar dates back 2,800 years and bears two nearly indecipherable inscriptions. The words were written in the Moabite language, with the numbers being written in Hieratic Egyptian. The altar itself dates back to a time after Mesha, king of Moab, rebelled against the kingdom of Israel. In the Hebrew Bible, the rebellion is mentioned as a historical event, but up until now, there has been absolutely no proof that it happened. The Bible says that before the rebellion, Moab was forced to pay tribute to Israel in the form of thousands of fresh lambs and an obscene amount of wool. This was enough to cause Moab to rise up, and they quickly conquered Ataroth and killed most of the city's inhabitants. One of the inscriptions on this ancient altar describes the plunder of Ataroth after the city was defeated. It appears that the bronze looted from the city was presented as an offering and then recorded on the altar. The second inscription is a little more mysterious. It states that 4,000 foreign men were scattered and abandoned, while the last part could only be deciphered as the desolate city. It's all quite cryptic. But one thing is certain, this archaeological evidence is proof that another story from the Bible is rooted in reality. New Desert Spider In the brutally hot and dry wasteland of India's Thar Desert, a new species of spider has been found. It's a jumping spider, an arachnid that can literally leap off the ground and latch onto your face. They are cute or terrifying depending on your thoughts about spiders. They live in the desert, usually perched on blades of grass. This discovery was made in the Thar Desert National Park Wildlife Sanctuary, named Pseudomogris sudhi, after an Indian zoologist. It's a totally new species which belongs to the larger family of Salticidae. In total, there are over 600 different genera of these jumping spiders, with three new ones discovered in India back in 2021. 35 species of this particular genus have been discovered across the globe. Luckily, you don't need to be worried about ever coming across one of these spiders unless you happen to be crawling around in the scrubland of the Thar Desert. This spider is pale, with sandy brown limbs, huge fangs, and markings of black and dark red. We don't know exactly how far it can jump, but almost certainly high enough to freak you out. Dinosaurs in the Sahara Experts have found yet another fantastic dinosaur that lived in the Sahara Desert 100 million years ago. The discovery was made by a team of Egyptian and American researchers who say the dinosaur was once a powerful meat eater. This ferocious predator is named Abelosauridae, and it grew to an almost unbelievable 36 feet in length. It wasn't just long, but extremely heavy as well, weighing about 3,000 kilograms. This is just one more monstrous beast added to the already long list of predators living in the Sahara back in the day. 
Researchers believe the prehistoric Sahara Desert is one of the most dangerous places that has ever existed. While we don't know how so many gigantic predators lived in such close proximity, scientists think it had something to do with specialized prey. In other words, a whole bunch of carnivorous dinosaurs lived in relative harmony because they each preyed on a different kind of victim. It made life for small animals a nightmare. The evidence of this dinosaur was discovered thanks to students at Ohio University, who recovered its bones in Egypt. It's actually an unnamed species of the Abelisaurid group, and the first of its kind. It lived approximately 98 million years ago, at a time when the western desert of Egypt, part of the Sahara, wasn't nearly as dry and inhospitable as it is now. So many dinosaurs have been found here that researchers are convinced this was actually a rainforest, or at least a lush jungle-type environment. The sheer number of predators suggests a thriving ecosystem, from the microorganisms to the carnivores. It's shout-out time! Big thank you to Dominic Adriance and Christy Gibson Cormier for supporting this channel. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already to join the Origins Explained family. Karchner Caverns In the southern desert of Arizona, two men discovered an underground wonder in the 1970s. As far as the story goes, two friends from college who studied in Tucson went out on a weekend excursion to look for an underground cave. What they ended up finding was Karchner Caverns, subterranean chambers which formed hundreds of millions of years ago. Arizona was once fully submerged underwater. As the water receded, it left a limestone layer underneath. And then, over the next 330 million years, that limestone turned into the Whetstone Mountains, and it also eroded and dissolved to create these passages underground. Then, over a span of about 200,000 years, minerals were carried by water under the ground where they filtered to create beautiful formations in a variety of vivid colors. The end result is what we see today. In Karchner Cavern's big room, there is the most extensive formation in the world of something called brushite moon milk, incredibly colored stalagmites and stalactites. The caverns are also home to over 1,500 bats in the summer. Have you been there? Let me know in the comments below. The Last King of Babylon A mysterious carving was discovered deep in the desert of northern Saudi Arabia. The carving depicts the very last king of Babylon, created 2,550 years ago. It also has an inscription explaining who this great ruler is. The carving was made in the 6th century BC to depict the Babylonian ruler Nabonidus. It was found by archaeologists from the Saudi Commission for Tourism and National Heritage engraved on a basalt stone in the Hale region. There are approximately 26 lines of ancient cuneiform script on it, making it the longest cuneiform inscription found in the region. The Babylonian king can be seen standing with a scepter in one hand and four very important symbols etched in front of him. There is a crescent moon, a sun, a snake, and a flower. Scholars believe the images hold some kind of religious significance, but haven't been able to actually identify that significance yet. They could be linked to ancient Mesopotamian deities, representing gods like Ishtar of the stars, the sun god Shamash, and the moon deity Sin. What we do know is that Nabonidus ruled Babylon from between the years 556 and 539 BC, which was terrible luck because this is when the kingdom fell to Persia. Babylon had stretched all the way from the Persian Gulf to the Mediterranean Sea, and Nabonidus had been responsible for conquering huge parts of Saudi Arabia. Just four years later, he was forced into exile north of El Hayt, and Babylon was brought to its knees. Aside from the single basalt rock with the carving on it, there are other mysterious archaeological sites found in this desert area. There are ruins of fortresses, broken water installations that once brought crops to the people of Al Hayt, known as Fadak in ancient times, and even ancient examples of rock art sand that breathes. In a bizarre new discovery, researchers have learned that desert landscapes are not quite as barren and lifeless as they may appear. Not only can the sand dunes of the desert grow and move, and even interact with one another, but they can also breathe. Researchers used a sensitive probe to reveal that sand dunes quite literally inhale and exhale water vapor. They did this by plunging their instrument into a sand dune in the Qatar desert. The instrument scanned the temperature, the radiation, and the moisture. It turns out that sand dunes inhale hard when it's dry, and that the wind sweeps off the top layer of sand, 
to create waves of humidity that push downward along the dunes. It all comes down to water vapor. Water vapor percolates between grains of sand like pores on the skin of the sand dunes. When the wind blows, these pores are opened and the pressure changes, injecting air into the pores and squirting out tiny invisible puffs of moisture. Mechanical engineer Michelle Luge explained it quite simply, saying the sand is breathing just like any other organism breathes. Even when no liquid is available, the sand dunes make their own moisture, and this breathing is probably what helps microbes stay alive in the sand. The Wonders of the Arabian Desert The Arabian Desert is home to so many magical ruins and forgotten pieces of history that you could spend weeks exploring them all. One of the most fascinating, perhaps, is in Abu Dhabi, a place called Bida Bint Saad. It's an ancient caravan site that once housed a great community of farmers, extending all the way north to the edge of the Arabian Peninsula. The small settlement used irrigation systems to bring life to the desert and flourished for at least 5,000 years. Near the ancient caravan hub, where traders from all over the world came to sell their goods, there are other places of interest, like Bronze Age tombs from 5,000 years ago and Garn bin Saad. Garn bin Saad is a rock about 120 feet tall that towers over the landscape. There are stone tombs embedded in the top, where the bones of the elite members of the desert societies in Abu Dhabi were once buried. Another fantastic place in the Arabian desert is the Hilly Archaeological Park. The site dates back to about 3,200 BC, to a time when human beings lived in rock-built huts, kind of like giant stone igloos. This is the largest collection of tombs and buildings in the United Arab Emirates from the Bronze Age. Archaeologists have found villages, entire burial grounds, and broken agricultural infrastructure from the Umm an nahr period. Ancient Home of Abraham British archaeologists recently uncovered a sprawling complex near the ancient Sumerian city of Ur in the desert of South Iraq. The structure is about 4,000 years old and had likely served as the administrative center for the powerful city of Ur, arguably one of the greatest cities to ever be built by human hands and certainly the first true metropolis to ever grace the planet. But it's also quite interesting because researchers say this particular structure was functional around the time when the biblical Abraham lived in the city, just before, according to the Bible, he left for Canaan. Stuart Campbell from Manchester University called this sprawling complex a breathtaking find. It's unusually large, over 260 feet on both sides, meaning it was likely one of the largest buildings in the city. Researchers believe it was used for administrative purposes, or it could have had religious connections. Whatever the case, it almost certainly played a major role in the politics of Ur. To put it into perspective, it's almost as if archaeologists have found the Supreme Court building of ancient Mesopotamia. The biggest mystery right now is trying to figure out why it was erected 12 miles from the actual capital of Sumer. Forgotten Mosque Archaeologists in the Israeli desert have discovered the ruins of one of the oldest mosques in the world. The ruins are 1,200 years old, located in the Negev desert. The discovery came during the construction of a new neighborhood. Builders uncovered a square room facing in the direction of Mecca. As you might already know, Mosques are always designed to face Mecca. It features a small niche where men have prayed and it could have held about a dozen worshippers at one time. It wasn't a very large building, but it was one of the first. Researchers discovered a luxurious estate building not very far away. This suggests the mosque was used by elite members of society as they practiced their religion. Islam arrived in Israel, specifically in the Negev desert region, extremely early in its spread. In the 7th century BC, about 1,300 years ago, a major transition started to take place as people of both Christian and Jewish faith began converting to Islam. It took a little longer for Islam to sweep across much of the rest of the world, first going through the Middle East and North Africa, but Israel was one of the very first places. And so it's no surprise to see that one of the oldest mosques ever built is still here in the sand, lying in ruins. Mysterious Tombs Five new tombs dating all the way back to the ancient Song Dynasty of China have just been discovered in the northwest province of Shanxi. The tombs were actually found while government workers were conducting road repairs. They broke through the surface of the road and came across some of the most stunning tombs ever seen. 
According to the head of the archaeological team, Li Kun, these subterranean chambers were all made from brick. Over 30 burial items have been uncovered so far, including copper coins and pottery pots. The chambers were also found to be decorated with weird cat carvings. Not jungle cats, but ordinary house cats cover these ancient tombs. It seems the people of the Song Dynasty, even a thousand years ago, had a fascination with house cats. As for who was buried in these amazing tombs, we don't really know that yet. The Song Dynasty began in the year 960 and lasted for around 300 years before they vanished. By 1279, the Yuan Dynasty from the north had come down to conquer China with help from the Mongolians, and the rest is history. Clues from a Welsh city A very recent archaeological dig in 2022 has revealed the oldest house in the city of Cardiff. At least, that's what archaeologists are speculating right now. Researchers with the Kyra and Eli Rediscovering Heritage Project discovered a single clay pot that dates back 3,000 years. When the pot was found, the researchers had been trying to find a missing link between the Iron Age and the Roman period. Instead, Dr. David Wyatt says they found something even more remarkable. They stumbled upon a roundhouse near the Cardiff West Community High School that shows the earliest clues of the origins of the Welsh city. To understand the complexity of what's happening here, we have to look at a few different periods in history. First, there is a place called the Kyra Hill Fort, about half a mile away from where the roundhouse was found. The hill fort was occupied in the late Iron Age, before the Romans showed up in Britain. But the researchers wanted to know what happened to the people of the hill fort following the Roman invasion. And so, they turned to the site near the high school, thinking the roundhouse might have been a secondary settlement. Instead, the roundhouse proved to be even older than the hill fort. It was occupied in the Bronze Age, around 1500 BC. And because it's standing in the city of Cardiff, that currently makes it the oldest known house there. But who made it, and how many other houses there were, and what they had to do with the Romans, is still a huge mystery. The Tortoise and the Egg A new strange and bizarre discovery has been found at the archaeological site of Pompeii. Inside, the Roman city buried in the ash of the volcanic eruption from 79 AD was found a tortoise and an egg. The tortoise and the egg were both discovered underneath the clay floor of a storehouse. Scientists believe the animal had probably died just before the actual eruption of Mount Vesuvius. It had dug itself a burrow underneath the storehouse so that it could safely lay its eggs. But then, something went wrong. According to Valeria Amoretti, an anthropologist who works at the site, the tortoise failed to properly lay any eggs, and that perhaps caused its death. The bizarre situation with the tortoise was discovered while experts were excavating an area of Pompeii that had been devastated before the eruption, about a decade earlier in 62 AD, by an earthquake. The earthquake had destroyed a large chunk of the city, and it had only recently been rebuilt when the volcano destroyed everything. But the story is not over yet. Researchers have been doing a lot of work to understand what was happening in Pompeii before the volcanic eruption. This tortoise has actually helped a lot. In this particular area, archaeologists have been able to figure out that not all the houses were rebuilt after the earthquake in 62. Many of the houses remained broken, and so the neighborhood became so deserted that wild animals moved in. This tortoise is evidence that even before the eruption, some neighborhoods of Pompeii were so sparsely populated that reptiles were living in the homes instead of humans. Cultural Entanglement A recently discovered tomb has revealed some bizarre cultural entanglements between the ancient kingdoms of Egypt and Nubia. Egypt and Nubia were at war a lot. The Egyptians hated their neighbors to the south, and they fought plenty of legendary battles to try and dominate the region. And then, around 1500 BC, the Egyptians finally conquered Upper Nubia, the area of what is today Northern Sudan. Once the Nubians were conquered and the people from both nations started to mingle, they began to take on cultural aspects of each other. Evidence of this cultural mixing has been revealed in the recently discovered graves of a pair of women. These women were discovered buried in the Nubian style but decorated with Egyptian fashion. They were entombed at an old cemetery in the ancient village of Tombos in Sudan. After Egypt's first major occupation of Nubia, 
Tombos became a colonial center. This was where much of the governing was happening and where most of the Egyptian citizens would have moved to start their new lives in what to them was a new world. Both of the women were buried on a bed in a flexed position, which is 100% Nubian style, but around one of their necks was an amulet of the Egyptian god Bess, and around the neck of the other woman was an Egyptian heart scarab. Both women appeared to be of high status, though it's not clear if they were racially Nubian or Egyptian. Professor Smith from Purdue University says these burials are direct evidence of a kind of cultural mashup. People had the ability to choose whether they wanted Nubian things or Egyptian things, as the culture slowly bled into one another at the frontier land between the two kingdoms. Medieval Demon The figure of a medieval demon was recently found during road construction in the United Kingdom. Workers were busy digging along part of a new section of Lincoln's Eastern Bypass when they came across the head of a sculpture that looked like it had come from outer space. This thing was ugly, with a bulbous nose like an anteater and huge eyes that could only belong to an otherworldly being. But of course, this figure was very much from our own planet. It actually dates back to around 1160 AD and is the head of a devilish beast. While it's not immediately obvious by looking at it because it's so weathered, the figure is supposed to have its mouth open and a human head stuck between its animal-like jaws. The carved head had probably come from a church or a chapel and was meant to depict a terrible demon swallowing a person down into its belly. This kind of sculpture is known as grotesque, a style of demon known as a beakhead. There were all kinds of these things in the medieval days in churches across the UK, demons made to look like nightmarish birds. Priests and preachers would have used these extremely graphic sculptures in their sermons to make people afraid of the terrible fate that would await them in hell if they never repented. Ancient Inca Tomb In the capital city of Lima, archaeologists discovered an ancient tomb from the days of the Inca Empire. But what's really crazy is that this tomb was discovered in the last place anyone would have expected. It was dug out from under an ordinary person's house. A working class family came across the entrance to the tomb, where down below their floor was sleeping a noble who had been down there for 500 years. According to the lead archaeologist on the project, Julio Abanto, the tomb was probably used for elite members of the Riricancho society. This was the culture that lived in Lima before the Inca showed up in the early 1400s and dominated most of western South America. But because the city of Lima was built over the remains of the prehistoric world, most of Riricancho's history has been lost. This mysterious discovery was a total fluke. The owner of the house, Hippolito Tica, was nearly in tears when he was talking to interviewers. He was so overcome with emotion and surprise that an actual piece of ancient Peruvian history had been hiding under his floor. Experts believe there are probably plenty more tombs hidden underneath the neighborhood, maybe even the remains of temples and other ancient buildings. Terracotta Statue Terracotta Statue No. 28 is posed in an extremely strange position. The statue was found inside the mausoleum of the great Chinese emperor Qin Shi Huang in Shanxi province, one of the thousands of terracotta warriors that were buried with the emperor to protect him in the afterlife. This was upon his death in 210 BC, after he had founded the Qin dynasty and unified China for the first time in history. But this particular statue has proved to be a little more mysterious than the others. Almost every single terracotta warrior statue inside the mausoleum is in a sitting or standing position. But number 28 was crafted to be kneeling on the ground while leaning backwards so that its shoulders brushed the ground, almost as if it was trying to limbo. The statue was taken out of pit K9901, and nobody's really sure why this statue was made to be so strange. One of the guesses is that number 28 along with other statues from the pit, were meant to be entertainers for the emperor in the afterlife. This statue could have been doing some kind of dance act or literally trying to limbo. Where the other terracotta statues were warriors, this one appears to be part of some kind of army of terracotta entertainers. Mysterious Coded Jewel An extremely mysterious jewel was recently discovered in North Carolina, specifically in Brunswick Town, 
a place which 300 years ago was practically on fire with hate for the British crown. This was a place where rebellions were plotted and where the British living in America planned their escape from British authority. The mysterious jewel was discovered in the ruins of a tavern, which actually predates the American Revolutionary period. The archaeologists found the pressed jewel on a very old cufflink and were shocked to see that it was inscribed with a secret code. There is a lot of information to unpack here, so let's go back to the tavern. It was built on the edge of Cape Fear River around the 1730s. Sometime in the 1760s, it burned down. That was one decade before the town itself was raised by the angry British during the Revolutionary War. We don't know why the tavern went up in smoke, but it may have had something to do with the revolutionaries conspiring inside of it. The jewel would have been worn on a cufflink, and it was etched with the tiny words, Wilkes and Liberty 45. This was the secret code that the American rebels used to show that they were in opposition to the King of England. This was a nod to the radical John Wilkes, who helped inspire the revolutionaries to fight back against their English oppressors. Human Bone Jewelry On a small island in Lake Oniga, Russia, archaeologists discovered burial remains that date back 8,200 years. But these burial remains are far more disturbing than you could ever imagine. A group of researchers from the University of Helsinki examined the prehistoric grave goods that were buried with the people and discovered that the bodies and the artifacts had quite a lot in common. The artifacts that were buried with the Stone Age humans were made from Stone Age humans. Scientists have always known that in the Stone Age, our prehistoric ancestors made jewelry out of bones and teeth, but they had always assumed the prehistoric people used animal bones. The new analysis of the remains from Russia shows that they had actually been using human bones to make jewelry. A total of 177 graves were excavated on the island. Inside many of the graves were artifacts made from teeth and bone, decorated with things like elk, beaver, and brown bears. The researchers also found small sculptures of animals, showing how incredibly important these creatures were to Stone Age life in freezing Russia. The biggest shock came when the researchers decided to test the bones to see what animals they came from and found that nearly half the samples were human bones. It seems humans in the Stone Age had no problem dissecting their dead friends and turning a femur into a statue or their teeth into a necklace. Arthur's Stone Arthur's Stone is a monument from the Stone Age that dates back 5,000 years. It can be found in England and is the subject of many different mythological tales and stories. There is even a legend that says the great King Arthur killed a giant here, and that when King Arthur knelt in front of the great stone to pray, his knee indentation was left etched on the ground. In 2022, archaeologists with the University of Manchester decided to find out once and for all what happened at Arthur's Stone. They visited the giant monument located near the border of Wales and Herefordshire, and then they started excavating. They haven't found much so far, but believe the whole area was extremely busy in ancient times. This stone monument was erected around the same time Stonehenge was built, roughly 3,700 BC, and so it could have been made by the same druids. While even though Arthur's stone looks like a single rock standing about 13 feet long and weighing 25 tons, initial excavations show it was probably part of something much larger. The entire structure may have been part of a mound over 100 feet long, with mysterious underground chambers. There could be bodies hiding under Arthur's stone, but the researchers still haven't found them. The Giant Nazi Eagle On December 13, 1939, three Royal Navy cruisers had a standoff with a German ship off the coast of Uruguay. This was the closest World War II ever got to South America. Then, in 2006, a huge Nazi eagle made of bronze was found in the same area, gripping a swastika with its talons. This gigantic piece of Nazi memorabilia was originally on the stern of the Nazi battleship that got into the altercation 75 years before. After the Battle of River Plate, the ship was scuttled. This was because the Germans feared that if the British got a hold of the ship, they would steal its state-of-the-art technology. The huge eagle is made almost entirely of bronze. 
After its discovery, it was taken to a warehouse that was guarded by the Uruguayan Navy. The Supreme Court ruled that the company which found the eagle should get 50% of its profits should the piece be sold, though they made Uruguay the rightful owners of it. Fast forward to 2022, and the object is still a source of controversy. Experts argue that it should go to a museum instead of being put up for auction at an estimated sale price of $26 million. At the moment, the 660-pound bronze eagle and swastika has yet to be sold. World War II Ghost Boat Over the years, much of the water in California has begun to dry up, and as a result, all kinds of strange and bizarre things have been found at the bottom of waterless lakes and rivers. At Shasta Lake, officials with the U.S. Forest Service came across a ghost boat that was used during World War II. The ship was revealed for the first time when all the water in the lake evaporated and the vessel was discovered sitting there at the bottom. The boat was found with the marking 3117 on its side, suggesting it had been assigned to the attack transport ship, the USS Monrovia, over 75 years ago. The Monrovia was the same vessel used as a headquarters for the famous General George S. Patton during the invasion of Sicily in 1943. It was also briefly used by President Eisenhower himself, and later during the D-Day invasions that took place in the Pacific. In the Pacific during World War II, there were more than 100 D-Days. But how in the world did the ghost boat get discarded in a lake in California after it became separated from its main attack vessel? That's a mystery that nobody has ever been able to solve. So far, there are two abandoned boats that have been found in California and nobody knows how they got there. Sunken Navy Destroyer Explorers recently discovered the wreckage of a Navy destroyer escort that fought against the Japanese fleet in World War II. The ship was part of the largest sea battle in human history, fought in the waters off the coast of the Philippines in 1944. The ship was identified as the USS Samuel B. Roberts, also known as the Sammy B. It was uncovered by American explorer Victor Vescovo, the same guy who found the USS Johnston in 2021. The Sammy B was discovered at an unimaginable depth of 22,916 feet, broken in half on an underwater slope. The Sammy B took part in the legendary battle off Samar, the deciding factor in the war against the Imperial Japanese Navy. They suffered their biggest loss of ships during this battle, and they failed to push back the U.S. forces. As a result, they were kicked out of the Philippines. The Sammy B managed to disable one of the Japanese heavy cruisers with a torpedo. However, the vessel spent almost all of its ammo fighting the great Japanese battleship the Yamato before being critically wounded by another battleship called the Congo. A total of 89 crew members lost their lives during this naval battle. In the end, the ship sank below the waves and wasn't seen again until it was finally discovered in 2022. At the moment, the site of the Sami B is currently the deepest wreck ever found. Nazi Bombs and the Sea Monster During an air raid that took place in London during World War II, Nazi pilots dropped bombs on an incredibly rare fossil of a sea monster in May of 1941. Explosives fell on the Royal College of Surgeons, where the fossil had been kept since 1820. It was originally excavated two years prior at a site in southwest England, and it made history as the first nearly complete skeleton of an ichthyosaur. But when the bombs fell on the college, it was blasted to smithereens. Just recently, scientists uncovered something nobody thought would ever be seen again. They came across two forgotten plaster casts of that same destroyed skeleton, one hiding in a museum in the United States and the other one in Germany. According to Dean Lomax from the University of Manchester, it was by chance that researchers found the casts in museum vaults. There have since been plenty of other ichthyosaur fossils discovered since World War II. These creatures lived from between 250 million and 90 million years ago, and they were kind of like killer dolphins with alligator snouts. However, it was still extremely exciting to recover a prized fossil that was thought to be destroyed by the Nazis, even if it's only in the form of casts. Scientists also say the fossil was likely discovered by Mary Anning, 
one of the world's first leading female paleontologists and fossil collectors. Toxic Nazi Shipwreck A Nazi patrol boat was sunk by British warfighters in 1942. The John Mann was originally a fishing trawler when it was launched in 1927. But when the war broke out in 1939, the German Navy repurposed the ship and turned it into the V-1302, a patrol boat. In February of 1942, it joined a convoy participating in Operation Cerberus, a simple maneuver to push battleships and heavy cruisers from the North Sea through the English Channel to German ports. The maneuver didn't go over very well and the British bombers rained fire down on the ships. The V-1302, previously the John Mann, was destroyed and 12 crew members were killed. Although many of the vehicles were damaged during the operation, the small patrol boat was the only one that sank. It's now sitting 115 feet below the waters in the North Sea off the coast of Belgium. Technically, the ship was never really lost. It's in such shallow water that everybody knows where it is. But in 2020, a research team from the Flanders Marine Institute in Belgium analyzed samples taken from the steel hull as well as the surrounding sea floor. They learned that the ship is still leaking toxic chemicals 80 years after it originally sank. And considering this was only a tiny patrol boat, it's likely that much larger vessels from the war are also leaking toxic chemicals to this day. The only good news is that scientists say the toxicity levels are relatively harmless, and the site of the wreckage is now rich in biodiversity. It has turned into an artificial reef over the years, and is home to fish, crabs, sea anemones, and a wide variety of marine plants. Even though the whole thing is toxic, life continues to flourish. Bomb in the Po River An extreme drought in Europe revealed an unexploded bomb from World War II tucked into the side of the River Po in Italy. A fisherman discovered the American-produced bomb in late July 2022, near the small Italian village of Borgo Virgilio. The bomb was hidden under the water and was partially covered in sand for over 70 years. But just like with the ghost boats appearing in the United States, drought revealed this lost wartime relic. Military experts were called in to deal with the bomb. According to them, it weighed almost 1,000 pounds. They had to excavate 3,000 civilians before military personnel could defuse the bomb. They then moved it to a quarry 30 miles away and detonated it under controlled circumstances. There were no injuries or damages and the whole process went very smoothly. The craziest part was that the bomb had been sitting there on the bank of the river all that time and nobody had known. If something had gone wrong and the bomb was hit by a propeller or involved in some other accident, who knows what kind of damage it could have caused. John Doe In August of 2022, the body of a John Doe was returned home after being missing for a total of 77 years. The remains of a man now identified as Private Carl G. Dorsey were finally returned to Moline, Kansas, a small town with a population of under 350 people. Dorsey will now get the chance to be buried in a modest ceremony with his living relatives. He will also be receiving full military honors. Carl's story takes us back to the beginning of World War II. He joined the military at 18 years old and was placed in the 4th Infantry Division. He was fatally wounded while battling Germans near Grosshau in the Hertgen Forest. It was one of the bloodiest battles in the war, lasting two months in the autumn of 1944. Carl was originally listed as missing, although in reality he was one of the 33,000 soldiers that were killed or injured during battle. His body was discovered shortly after the combat by a German citizen, and he was buried as a John Doe. Up until his remains were officially identified and he was exhumed and returned to the United States, he was one of the 46,599 U.S. servicemen still unaccounted for from World War II. However, experts believe the unofficial number could be as high as 77,000. Mysterious War Object on the Beach A family in Texas just discovered an extremely unusual object that washed up on the beach. They were on vacation when their trip turned into a real-life history lesson. Amanda Ward was visiting Port Aransas Beach with her family one Saturday afternoon when they came across a gigantic bundle of mystery material. 
They couldn't identify what they were looking at, but it looked like a rock with skin growing on it. The family began poking and prodding the curious object, which was wrapped in a tan-colored, flesh-like coating and had barnacles and clams clinging to the outside of it. When they still couldn't figure out what it was, the family posted photographs of the object online to get a public opinion. There was a lot of speculation, and many people chimed in to give their theories of what the bundle could possibly be. Some claimed it was a lost Amazon package, others said it could be a chest full of treasure. But as it turned out, the discovery was nothing but a rubber bale from a sunken German ship from World War II. This was not the first time such a mysterious object washed up on the beach either. These bales started appearing in Texas and Florida in 2020, and before that, they were found along the beaches in Brazil. The story behind these bundles began back in January of 1944. The SS Rio Grande, a German blockade runner, was spotted by the USS Omaha off the coast of Brazil. The Rio Grande was carrying tin, cobalt, copper, and raw rubber bales. The crew of the vessel abandoned ship after they realized they were spotted. This ultimately saved their lives, since the Omaha opened fire on the ship and sank it. All these years later, giant rubber bales are still washing up on eastern shorelines. The HMS Urge The British submarine HMS Urge was discovered by divers in 2021. It was sunk by a German mine while cruising underwater near Malta in 1942. Maritime archaeologist Timmy Gambin and other researchers from the University of Malta made two dives down to the wreckage in order to identify it as the HMS Urge. This was fairly easy to do, considering the name was etched onto its tower. Before it went missing in April of 1942, this submarine had a strong naval career. It crippled the Italian battleship Vittorio Veneto and even sank the Italian cruiser Bandenere. But after the British Admiralty ordered the submarine to regroup in Egypt, it went missing. Malta was bombarded by the German and Italian air forces, and HMS Urge never arrived in Alexandria to meet up with the rest of the warships. For a long time, nobody knew what happened to it. It was officially reported lost at sea, with 32 crew and 11 other personnel on board. The ship was initially found in 2015 by a Belgian diver off the coast of Libya, who claimed it was sunk by Italian warplanes during a secret mission. This caused a bunch of conspiracy theories to start circulating, but none of them had any merit. When the wreck was officially discovered off the coast of Malta, researchers were finally able to learn what really happened. The urge never even managed to escape the coastal waters. The vessel ended up hitting a mine and went down without a fight. Fishing for an engine In April 2022, the engine of an aircraft from World War II was pulled out of the water off the coast of New Jersey. A former National Guardsman was out fishing for squid in the waters of Cape May when he accidentally reeled in what may have been the engine of an F6F3 Hellcat. The squid fisherman's name is Randy Camp, and he was accompanied by the ship's captain named Jake Wiscott. They were going about business as usual when they felt something heavy stuck in their net. When they finally managed to get the mystery object into their boat, they realized they had something very special. Randy reached out to his contacts at the Naval Air Station Wildwood Aviation Museum, and the curator identified the engine as a Pratt & Whitney 18-cylinder R2800. Apparently, this type of engine was used by many military aircrafts during World War II, so it was difficult to identify exactly where it came from. It could have been from the Grumman F6F Hellcat, a deadly fighter used for battling the Japanese Mitsubishi A6M Zero during the war, or it may have belonged to a Northrop P61 Black Widow fighter. There is also a chance that the engine came from a Douglas DC-6, which is still used for transporting cargo to this day. But how did a random engine get stuck on the bottom of the Atlantic? This happened because Cape May was once a stronghold for the Navy during the Second World War. They had their administrative headquarters inside the Cape May Hotel. The whole area needed a strong military presence because it would have been a particularly ideal target for the German Nazis. 
the aircraft engine most likely got discarded off the side of a boat for whatever reason, then sat at the bottom of the ocean for 70 years. Thanks for watching! Which of these World War II discoveries did you find the most exciting? Engi of Babylon the Atrahasis epic is the ancient story of a great flood sent by the many gods of Mesopotamia to destroy all of human life. It's very much like the other flood myths found in every religion since the dawn of time, but with a different twist. In the Babylonian version, it's the god Enki who warns a single good human, a man named Atrahasis, to build an ark. Written in the 17th century BC, the Atrahasis is believed to be based on a story that was much older, passed down from generations before. The Sumerian flood story was written in 2300 BC, and the Epic of Gilgamesh that also tells the story of a great flood is older than that. The Atrahasis begins when the world was created, but human beings didn't exist yet. The story goes that the elder ancient Mesopotamian gods would force the younger gods to do all of the work on Earth, like digging out the path for the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. They got tired and rebelled. So Enki, the young god of wisdom, convinced the rest of the gods to create something new to do the work instead. The gods then used their resources to create human beings, starting with seven men and seven women, who became the first humans on Earth. At first, the gods loved having these human servants, but they started to get annoyed because the humans were always causing problems. The most powerful god, Enlil, became angry and sent plagues and drought to make them suffer. Finally, the gods decide to send a flood to wipe them out. Enki feels bad for one of the humans, Atrahasis, and warns him. Atrahasis must gather two of every animal on his ark so that life on the planet can be saved. After the flood, the gods feel bad and regret what they have done. Enki proposes a new solution to the gods so that the humans stop causing so much trouble. There will now be more suffering. Demons will destroy infants and women will die giving birth. And so the god of wisdom also brings about suffering to humankind. Cernunos Cernunos, or Cernunus, is the name of an ancient Celtic god who represented all things in nature, from flora to fauna and even fertility. This is a little strange because most deities in the ancient world involved with fertility were female. Cernunus was an exception. He can be seen depicted in ancient artwork as a stag, wearing horns or antlers, and also as a cross between a deer and a bird. Valca Monica in Italy is home to one of the greatest collections of prehistoric petroglyphs covering a span of over 8,000 years. Here you can see representations of the magical god standing and wearing a long tunic. He holds a knife in his hand and wears antlers on his head. Images of him can be found everywhere in the Celtic world, including France, Denmark, Germany, Ireland, the list goes on. Sometimes he is sitting down, holding a knife and surrounded by snakes and oxen and wolves. Historians believe Cernunos may have been the inspiration for later depictions of the devil in Christian medieval literature, even though he represented nature and fertility. Nobody is entirely sure what this god's name means, although some have associated it with the Celtic word for horn. Because of that, he's considered the Celtic horned god, one of many horned gods in Celtic mythology. There are so many gods, monsters, and great beings in Celtic lore, and because they really didn't write much down, a huge portion of them have been lost. The Anonymous God of Palmyra At the ancient site of Palmyra, located in modern Syria, archaeologists uncovered over 2,500 inscriptions in the Aramaic language. These texts date back to as early as the 2nd century AD and seem to suggest there was some kind of anonymous god worshipped by the people here. The biggest mystery for scientists has been trying to figure out who exactly the celestial deity was and what role they played in society. The thing that makes it so confusing is that the inscriptions refer to the deity as he whose name is blessed forever, lord of the universe, and other lofty titles. It was the Polish archaeologist Aleksandra Kubiak-Schneider who analyzed the inscriptions, which were found on stone altars in the ancient city where sacrifices had taken place. 
She said that for at least 100 years, the people of Palmyra worshipped a single deity that was the Lord of the heavens and who had no name. One inscription said that the Great One came in the hour of trouble, made a miracle on the day of justice, dated 214 AD. Clearly, this was quite the benevolent being. So why didn't he have a name? Researchers believe it was actually taboo to say the name of the deity aloud, which is why he's considered anonymous. To understand where such a god came from, researchers had to look closer at the ancient city itself. Palmyra originally functioned as a caravan city until around the 1st century AD, when it became a huge metropolis from which trade came through Persia, India, and China. It was one of the richest cities around, a pearl in the desert. The people who lived here were from all parts of the world, and many of them were freed slaves. This means that many different religions were floating around at the same time. A kind of cult must have sprang up from all of these conflicting religious beliefs, and the people just kind of agreed to worship a single great entity. Either that, or they agreed to reference all the entities as Lord of the World and not say their names out loud. Miklantecutli Miklantecutli was the Aztec deity of death, a terrifying figure from ancient Mexico that was normally portrayed with the face of a skull. Along with his wife, Miktecasihuatl, he ruled the underworld called Mictlan. He lived at the very bottom of this place, which similarly to the Christian version of hell, had nine levels. When a person died, they were forced to journey for four long years through horrible trials, all the way to the bottom of the nine levels of Miklan to be able to be with their god. This is pretty unique in the world of forgotten religions because there was no paradise, purgatory, or perdition. There was only Miklan, where all the souls of the dead went except for women who died during childbirth, people taken by storms, and those sacrificed. All the rest traveled to meet the Aztec god of death, who would either allow their soul to rest or make them disappear forever. Historians believe the Lord of the Dead was worshipped across the entire Mesoamerican world. Just like how so many gods in Mesopotamia came and went under different names, so too was Mictlantecutli represented in Mesoamerica. He was known as Yumsimil to the Maya, as Quero to the Zapotec, and as Tiwime to the Tarascan. Regardless of which particular culture was worshipping him, he was always the god of death and the underworld, symbolized by owls, spiders, and bats. Kagutsuchi Kagutsuchi is known in Japan as the Shinto god of fire. He also goes by the name Homusubi and is the son of Isanami and Isanagi. For those not familiar with the Shinto religion, Isanami and Isanagi are the creator gods. These are the primordial beings who pulled the islands of Japan out of the sea and gave birth to the rest of the gods, known as Kami. Kagutsuchi fathered eight warrior gods, eight mountain gods, and several others. He was considered a destructive force to the Japanese, because to them, fire was one of the most dangerous elements. They typically made their houses and buildings from wood and paper instead of stone and mud like so many other cultures. Because of this, offerings needed to be made to Kagutsuchi frequently or else their houses would all burn down. The story of Kagutsuchi's birth is rather disturbing. He was so fiery hot that he killed his mother during birth, and his father was so angry that he chopped off his head. The blood that squirted from Kagutsuchi's neck gave birth to his first eight children and they all became powerful demigods and masters of martial arts. His father chopped the rest of his body up with his sword, and as more blood was shed, more children were born. In the Edo period between 1603 and 1868, the Japanese lived in mortal fear of this god. They performed massive ceremonies to ward him away, so that he wouldn't come and burn them in their sleep. Namu. During the days of the first great kingdom of Sumer, they worshipped a large pantheon of gods. One of the most important was called Namu, the primeval mother goddess who not only created humanity, but gave birth to the gods themselves. She may have been the inspiration for Gaia, the figure of Mother Earth from Greek mythology. She was also later replaced by the Babylonian mother goddess Tiamat. 
Throughout just about every religion, up until people started worshipping a single god, there was always a mother goddess, and she was always responsible for the creation of pretty much everything. Unfortunately, Namu's story is a little vague, with her story changing over the centuries. We know she helped Enki to create humanity when the gods became too annoyed to do the work to build Earth. We also know she was likely the city patroness of Eridu, before Enki replaced her. Namu's importance waned over time. The Babylonian counterpart, Tiamat, became far more popular as the mother goddess, and the creation story changed as well. By the time the Sumerians were gone, so too was the memory of Namu. Luna Luna was, to the Romans, the daughter of Hyperion and Theia, and one of the most important figures in the original Roman pantheon. Her father, Hyperion, was the ruler of heavenly light and one of the twelve titan children of Gaia and Uranus. Theia was his sister, the goddess of sight whose brilliance was unparalleled. Luna was, in all likelihood, a personification of the moon. Her brother was Sol, the sun god, and her sister was Aurora, the goddess of the dawn. Luna was also the lady consort, at least one of them, of powerful Jupiter, god of sky, thunder, and king of all the standard Roman gods. He was essentially Zeus, since Roman and Greek mythology really did mirror each other in almost every way. The most interesting story involving Luna has to do with her and an astronomer named Endymion. He was also one of Jupiter's consorts, but Luna took a particular shine to him. As the goddess of the moon, she came to Endymion every night and gave him her protection, and they ended up having 50 offspring together called the Manet. These were representations of the 50 months of the four-year cycle based on the old Greek measurement of time. Moloch out of all of the old Canaanite gods, Moloch was by far the worst and the most terrifying. He was described in the Old Testament as a great and terrible god, associated with human sacrifice. He is mentioned only briefly and in the most vague way possible, with no information of where exactly he came from. In fact, Moloch is quite a mystery. We know he wasn't worshipped by the Israelites because they never practiced the ritual of sacrificing humans to appease gods. That means that Moloch goes back much further in time, at least to the Phoenicians. Unfortunately, the true extent of Moloch's horror is not historically known. We've seen him all over the ancient world depicted as either a bull, an ox, or even a minotaur. He may have been the Ammonite god Milcom, or he could have been the god Baal from old Mesopotamia. Whatever the case, cults of worshippers praised Moloch as they practiced human sacrifice, quite often with children. In every story and in every mythology, regardless of what name he goes by, Moloch is always represented as some kind of bull, and he's always in need of child sacrifice victims. There are some unconfirmed stories that the cultists used to fashion metal bulls with empty stomachs, then put children inside the bulls and roast them alive. Lord Varuna Lord Varuna is one of the oldest and most important Vedic deities from ancient India. There are four Vedas, all-knowing gods who represent the heavens, the earth, the air, and the water. These gods are always there, always listening, and all-powerful. For example, the ancient Vedic texts speak of Lord Varuna as someone who encompasses the entire world, and for that he's worshipped as the personification of the sky. He is also believed to be the one who controls all bodies of water, and so he's the god of the ocean too. He has 1,000 eyes so that he can see everything that's happening in the world at the same time, and he's normally spotted flying around on a chariot pulled by seven beautiful swans. However, there are also depictions of Lord Varuna as a man adorned in golden armor and sitting on the back of a Makara, an ancient sea monster. To this very day, Hindus continue to worship Lord Varuna. Most people consider him the sea god, and it's customary to offer him a coconut on the Raksha Bandhan day. He plays a role in many important rituals, because after all, who wants to anger the sea and the sky? Chaos Before there was a pantheon of gods in Greek mythology, there was nothing. The world was a dark void. And then there was chaos. Chaos emerged at the dawn of creation from the darkness. Chaos was often represented as a female entity, a primordial force of mass and energy. She was the beginning of everything, an endless twisting darkness of creation and potential. Chaos was also the atmosphere around the earth, the invisible air and the fog and the mist. 
It was from chaos that the three primordial gods were born. She gave birth to Gaia, the earth, Tartarus, the underworld, and Eros, love. Some Greeks then referred to chaos as male, a god of fate that was self-created. Chaos would go on to bear two more gods, Erebus, the darkness, and Nyx, the night. Greek writers and philosophers would go on to define chaos as the mix of elements that existed in the universe. Chaos has no father or mother or creator and knows everything that happens in the universe and beyond. Brazilian Prison Town The Brazilian village of Dois Rios is home to about 90 residents. The village has no grocery store, not a single church, and is in the midst of being swallowed by the jungle. It's over 100 miles from Rio de Janeiro, positioned on a mostly virgin island known as Ilha Grande. But while this place may look like a jungle paradise, in truth it has a dark and haunting past. Many of the buildings are abandoned and filled with tropical vegetation. The old soccer pitch has turned into a grove of trees, and the main square of the city is gradually becoming a meadow. Prior to 1884, the village was home to an estimated 5,000 enslaved people brought to Brazil from Africa. These people worked the sugarcane fields and coffee plantations. In 1888, slavery was abolished in Brazil. Local authorities purchased the island and turned it into a prison. According to Associate Professor Gelson Rosentino with Rio de Janeiro State University, prison islands were all the rage at that time. In the second half of the 19th century, all the best prisons were on islands, from Alcatraz to Pianosa. The tropical island remained a prison until deterioration and prisoners' rights organizations caused it to be gradually abandoned. By 1994, most of the prison complex was destroyed. Because the community on the island had relied on the labor of the prisoners to live, conditions quickly grew dire. Food supplies dwindled, the schools shut down, and the houses fell into disrepair. There are still a few people on the island now, but the town is slowly fading away. Tomb of the Deposed Emperor Liu He was one of the worst emperors in Chinese history. He ruled during the Han Dynasty, installed as the emperor in 74 BC. But just 27 days after he was made emperor, he was deposed and scratched off the list of official emperors. There were supposedly 1,127 examples of misconduct placed against him, and he was banished. Emperor Liu He was such a disgrace that he was exiled to live life as a commoner. He died about 20 years later, though his bloodline lived on through his 22 children. Even though he was banished, he still had 16 wives. We don't know what happened that made the emperor shamed so publicly. Many of the records surrounding his life were intentionally destroyed to erase him from the history books. But here's where the mystery thickens. The deposed emperor's tomb was discovered in the northern part of Xinjiang in 2011. Archaeologists entered his tomb and discovered over 20,000 artifacts. Even though he was supposedly banished to life as a peasant, he was buried in a massive grave filled with jade artifacts, gold and bronze, and 5,000 pieces of bamboo slips written with the wisdom of Confucius. Clearly, the emperor was still important enough to be buried with an insane amount of riches. What he did to be banished, why he was still important upon his death, and why his name was nearly scrubbed from history is unknown. Garden of the Hesperides Lyxus was once a major Phoenician city alongside the river Lucos, right at the edge of the Atlantic Ocean. The mysterious city in modern Morocco was supposedly the site of a mythical garden from which golden apples grew in abundance. This was the mythical place out of antiquity called the Garden of the Hesperides. Legends say the garden was tended by magical nymphs. It was also the place in Greek mythology where Hercules had to travel to kill the Ladon dragon which protected the garden from trespassers. Today, the city of Lyxus is little more than a ruin. Its streets have turned to dust. The Temple of Hercules is a crumbling mess of stone, and the Roman theater has been abandoned for centuries. The old channels that once brought running water to the inhabitants are dry, and there is no sign of the mythical garden said to have gifted the residents with delicious golden apples. Great Zimbabwe The ancient city of Great Zimbabwe was supposedly one of the most impressive metropolises on the planet. 
Modern archaeologists agree it was an engineering wonder of the ancient world. However, the archaeologists of the past credited the African city to the Phoenicians or Babylonians. No one could believe such a grand place was built by Africans. This was a major issue with archaeology prior to these most recent decades. People who were supposed to be brilliant scientists were ignorant to the history of Africa and racist, believing any great ruins found on the continent were built by the Arabians or wandering tribes of Mesopotamians. We now know that was very wrong. There is no better example of how wrong the old explorers were than Great Zimbabwe. It was a megalithic city built of stone between roughly 1100 and 1450 AD in Zimbabwe. It was likely the work of the Shona culture, whose descendants make up much of the local population to this day. But it may have also been built by other neighboring societies who migrated to the city looking for a better life. 600 years ago, Great Zimbabwe had roughly the same number of people living in it as London, England. The city grew wealthy through trade, and they were positioned to receive caravans from Arabia, India, and China. Unfortunately, we don't know what happened here in the end. After 350 years of unparalleled prosperity, this city was abruptly abandoned. It's now nothing but a ruin, with the busted fragments of the old royal city, mud brick houses, large walls, and conical towers littering the site. There are also the ruins of over 200 smaller settlements and trading posts in the surrounding area. China's Secret Pyramid China supposedly has a gigantic pyramid that dates back 8,000 years. This mysterious pyramid is top secret and rumored to be guarded by the military. Whispers of the structure go back to at least 1912. That was when Fred Meyer Schroeder, an American trader, was traveling through the Shanxi province. He wrote in his diary that he witnessed a pyramid standing roughly 1,000 feet tall and twice as wide. He also claimed it was surrounded by a group of smaller pyramids. Three decades later, U.S. Air Force pilot James Gossman witnessed a pure white pyramid while flying over China that he claimed was twice the size of the Great Pyramid of Egypt. When the German investigator Hartwig Hausdorff traveled to China in the 1990s, he couldn't find it. Instead, he encountered the Chinese military patrolling the area. No one has ever been able to take a clear picture of this pyramid, and no mainstream archaeologists have been invited to investigate. The pyramid is supposedly kept a major secret by China, but nobody understands why. Maybe it's a royalty thing, with China not wanting to disrupt the graves of buried rulers from centuries past. Or maybe it's something even weirder. Do you think China is hiding a pyramid? Let me know in the comments below. Dragon's Triangle The mysterious Dragon's Triangle is the Japanese version of the Bermuda Triangle. In Japanese folklore, the triangle has been considered a dangerous and unpredictable zone for at least 1,000 years. Locals call it Mano Umi, which translates roughly to the Devil's Sea. The mystery is that things here seem to disappear. Sailors have reported fishing boats vanishing without a trace. Some have supposedly witnessed a dragon rise to the surface of the water, and others have seen entire crews be pulled from their boat down to the watery seabed. Between 1952 and 1954, five Japanese military vessels and 700 crew members allegedly disappeared within the Dragon's Triangle. The triangle itself begins in Tokyo, moves southeast to Guam, the northwest to the southern tip of Taiwan, and north again to Japan. Technically, the whole area is part of the Philippine Sea. It is a volatile and highly volcanic region known for its seismic activity. In Japanese legend, it was the Dragon's Triangle that wiped out the fleet of the Mongol ruler Kublai Khan when he tried to invade Japan in 1281. Japan was on the brink of being conquered by the Mongolians when their ships were decimated by two mysterious storms that rose without warning. Since then, the Japanese have attributed their safety to the wrath of the Dragon's Triangle, which sank 900 Mongol ships and killed 40,000 soldiers. Caves of Mystery Outside the city of Bhubaneswar in India, there is a mysterious archaeological site called the Udayagiri Caves. The caves here are partly natural and partly human-made. They serve as temples and have been around since at least the 1st century BC. 
There are a total of 32 caves that began as natural caverns and were transformed by human hands into marvelous temples. All the temples except one were dedicated to the Jainism religion. Jainism is one of the oldest religions on the planet, dating back 500 years before Christianity. It is still widely practiced in India with an estimated 5 million followers. Much like Buddhism and Hinduism, Jainism promotes enlightenment and encourages people to be non-violent and respect plants and animals and speak the truth. Followers of Jainism are not allowed to steal, they cannot become attached to worldly possessions, and ideally, they are celibate. Just like how Buddhism worships the great Buddha, Jainism has its own spiritual leaders as well. There are 24 jinas who supposedly reach spiritual enlightenment and thus escaped the vicious cycle of physical rebirth. The Udayagiri caves were made by worshippers of this religion. One of the caves may have even been occupied by the legendary Queen of Lala Tendu Kesari. Historians believe she may have lived in the double-storied cave with 32 cells, each one decorated with well-preserved sculptures and reliefs. Citadel La Ferriere Citadel La Ferriere is one of the most spectacular archaeological sites in Haiti. It is an iconic and massive stone fortress located on top of a jungle mountain, utterly abandoned and totally creepy. It was built purely for defense. The issue with a small island like Haiti is that building traditional coastal fortifications was not ideal. Fortresses like that would be vulnerable to any attack by sea. By building a citadel at the top of a mountain, the Haitians had a much better chance of defense. They could attack invaders trying to breach the island and had a major defensive position that would be nearly impossible to beat. But why was the citadel built at all? Construction was complete in 1820, with the whole point to protect the recently freed Haitian people. There was a real concern that the French army would come back and enslave them a second time. To prevent that from happening, they built a monumental fort to defend themselves, but the French never came back and so its 365 cannons never got used. Temple of Seti I One of the greatest and most mysterious temples in all of Egypt can be found in the ancient city of Abydos. It's the famous Temple of Seti I, carved out of stone 3,000 years ago. The temple originated as a necropolis for Egyptian royalty throughout the first and second dynasties. Then it transitioned into a place of worship it quickly became one of the top pilgrimage destinations in Egypt for the cult worship of Osiris. As the worship of Osiris became more and more popular, pharaohs continued to build more monumental structures in Abydos. The temple grew positively massive, as each Egyptian king made it better and better to show their dedication. Then, under the rule of Ramses I in the 19th dynasty, between 1290 and 1279 BC, the Temple of Seti I reached its peak. It was even home to the Abydos King List, a long gallery with the cartouches of the previous 76 ruling pharaohs. It's behind the temple that we find one of its most intriguing features. There is a large structure called the Osirion. The mystery is that no one knows what it is. The structure is behind the main temple but doesn't seem to hold any purpose. Some have suggested it was designed as a copy of a tomb from the Valley of the Kings. Archaeologists say that nowhere else in Egypt is any similar architecture found, giving them very little to compare it to. We don't know who built it, what it was for, or why its foundations are even lower than the temple in front of it. Hisham's Palace Hisham's Palace was built around the year 734 AD in the Jordan Valley during the rule of Caliph Hisham ibn Abdel Malik. It's an important historical place because it was one of the very last desert palaces built in Jordan. In other words, it was one of the final pieces of ancient architecture constructed during the reign of the Second Islamic Caliphate. It's famous today for its simplistic style, its construction of sandstone and baked brick, and its classical Islamic illustrations. The mysterious ruins consist of three main parts. There is the bath complex, the agricultural estate, and the palace itself. But you might be wondering what's so mysterious about the palace. The thing that really bothers archaeologists is that they don't know who lived in Hisham's palace. There are no textual sources that reference it. We know it was a product of the Umayyad dynasty. 
the second caliphate to rule after the death of the Prophet Muhammad. This was a time when desert fortifications, palaces, and castles were built throughout the Jordan Desert. Each construction was usually funded by a figure within the Umayyad ruling family. But the patron of Hisham's palace is an enigma. The second mystery is that we don't know what happened to this place. It was destroyed around 749 AD, shortly after it was built. Some suggest it was an earthquake, but that's never been proven. The whole place was abandoned shortly after and then lost to the desert sands. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more videos like these, and I'll see you next time. Bye!